WizKids here sent me uh, a lot of minis. And they're all the Spelljammer minis, and a lot of them include all of the ships, which I know you were probably upset about as well, that there is no ship combat for uh, said ships. So I have been tinkering away, and I've created some ship combat rules that blend a little bit of the second edition with Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus rules and Ghosts of Salt Marsh and things like that to kind of create what I believe would be a fun encounter for spaceship combat stuff. Now, one of the big caveats, though, is this is not playtested. But I'm not charging anything. You can get this for free. I'm going to put links down below. You can read through the document, see if you like it. And I'm going to explain it here while we use a lot of these minis to play Spelljammer ship combat. A lot of these rules are taken from second edition and I kind of just extrapolated on them to make them an easier fifth edition. So take all of this with uh, your own interpretation and you can modify and change the rules as you see fit. My goal was to make combat more interesting and to make it fun. I wanted combat to be kind of a collective decision of all of the players at the table. So I'm not very good at layouts and what have you. I use uh, Google Docs, but these are uh, rules for ships and helms, Spelljammer 5e. Um, going into, uh, I reference the Astral Adventures Guide a lot, which is the 5e Spelljammer because it has all of the ships. Things to note from Spelljammer Original 2e and Spelljammer 5e is the damage threshold is 15, which means that you need to do 15 or greater damage for any of that damage to be applied. So if I do 30 damage, I don't necessarily take 15. I the di I did 30 damage total. But if you did 14 damage, you did zero damage total. So it prevents you from just firing arrows and what have you. You need to get over that 15 in order for any of that damage to apply to your ship. Now from this page, you should look at the type of ship it is. If it's made of wood, the armor class 15 wood, uh, wood can catch fire. Other materials can't catch fire. That's really just what I wanted to bring up. So first of all, you have a crew. We have this crew of 15 for the Hammerhead ship. A crew of 15 um, is the minimum amount of crew it takes to have all of the weapons ready to fire every round. So your pilot navigates the ship and then you have three crew that get on the ballista and those three crew allow you to load, aim, and fire all with uh, in a single turn. So looking over at ship's weapons, if your if your crew is killed or damaged or attacked or something like that, then you won't be able to fire your ballista every single round. So if I have a, a like crew of three, they're on the ballista, one action to load, aim, and fire, but let's say one of my crew members gets killed by something that happens on our ship, all of a sudden I can load and aim it, but I can't fire it. And so this is where I think player characters could jump in to help certain situations because the crew got hurt. Data. Ah. Also, you'll notice that the ar all of the weapons have an armor class and hit points, and I would just ignore that unless uh, you're you want to play by very like focus firing. But I would just ignore it. Just focus on the hip ship ship hit points, and then let those stop functioning when the crew gets injured or uh, when other mishaps happen on the ship critical hit table. I did think it was important to, to highlight that the ship, like the Hammerhead ship specifically, uh, certain weapons are on certain locations. So the ballista can probably fire in a big circle, but not necessarily behind because you'll, you'll hit your own ship. Um, and then the other weapons, which are the blunt ram, that can only work facing forward. So your ship needs to be pointed towards the enemy in order for that to actually work. Oh, same with the uh, mangonels. They are on the front and the rear, so the rear mangonel can't necessarily fire to the sides or to the front of the ship. And this is part of the ship combat mechanics where positioning is important because your pilot is the one positioning the ship 
allowing certain weapons to fire at certain uh, enemies. And this brings us to movement. I want to I want to simplify movement. We're going to say if we're using a hex grid, every hex is five feet. Now, every hex is not necessarily five feet in uh Spelljammer world because a ship is like 100 feet long or 200 feet long and it fits in this one hex. I get it. But to make it simple, I want to say that every hex is five feet and you will take your speed and divide that by five. So if I have 35 feet of movement on my hammerhead ship, if I divide that by five, I have seven hexes of movement. Now on top of moving every hex, rotating your ship takes a movement of hex. I have these great screenshots from my original video. So if I move forward one, that takes one of my movement of the seven that I have for my ship. If I rotate my ship, that also takes one piece of movement. And you will not be able to move as fast as you anticipate, which brings us to spell searching. Kind of jumping ahead, but I wanted to say so. Spell surging is where the spellcaster pilot can sacrifice a spell slot that they have. Um, so if they have uh, fifth level spells, they can use one of their fifth level spell slots. It is gone. It's as if you cast a fifth level spell, but you gain five extra hexes of movement. So you can you can spell surge. You can push your ship farther than its normal means. And this is a gamble because at the end of a spell surge, you need to roll a d20 and roll under the spell level you used. So if I used a fifth level spell, I would want to roll a six or above to avoid uh, a mishap. But if I roll a five or below, then we would roll on a table and it's like, I pushed my ship too far, it's falling apart, something happened, uh, and that's the spell surge table. So the risk reward is there for the player to uh, to, to move forward. So jumping back up a little bit, uh, pilots, uh, spell jamming ships require a pilot. Uh, you have to attune to it. Um, I'm using most of the, the main rules in uh, the fifth, fifth edition spell jammer stuff. So you have, to, you have to do that. If you're proficient with a vehicle, I think you should be able to add your proficiency bonus because why not? How many people take vehicle proficiency? I think it's kind of cool that you could do that. Um, and that you can fly for 12 hours before you need a rest, and if you push yourself harder than that, you're going to suffer uh, levels of exhaustion. I wanted to minimize direct attacks on the pilot, because that seems like a very easy thing to do, like I'll just go for the pilot. Um, but instead, a pilot can only be attacked by a boarded crew, and a pilot will have half cover when they're on their spell jamming helm. This could be the position of where the, the helm is, or this could be magical forces protecting it. Up to you, I just think give them a break, they have half cover. Now the pilot uses their movement to move the ship on their turn. They use their bonus action to spell surge. They still have their action. So if there are people coming down to attack the pilot and remove them from the helm, he could, he or she could use their spells like magic missile to push away people or to repel things or to cast shield on yourself. So there's a, a they still have their reaction and they still have their main action. So here's where we get about critical hits. So critical hits occur when uh, a natural 20 on an attack roll against another ship, specifically ship, not monster, because monsters can't roll necessarily on the ship critical hit table, but ships can. So a natural 20 against that ship, um, or if the ship's hit points dip below 50%. And yes, if you roll a natural 20 and you add up all that damage and it also dips the ship below 50%, you would roll twice on the ship critical hit table. Now this is just a d20 table, but it has things like the ship loses uh, extra hit points on that attack. There's a random crew casualty, so now you're down crew, which means some of your weapons might not work. The ship is shaken, which means everybody needs to make a dexterity saving throw, or they might get thrown off of the ship and then have to find out how to come back on. Uh, there could be a maneuverability loss where you're unable to turn your ship for a round. Uh, there could be a fire on your ship. There could be a uh, spell jammer shock is the big one where your spell jammer pilot becomes unconscious for 1d4 hours because of uh, the shock of the spell jammer. So uh, 
really cool, and this applies to monsters as well, or to enemy ships as well as your own ship. Um, some rules on when a ship gets to zero hit points, if it's an enemy ship, it will break apart. For every 10 tons the ship is, you would roll a d6, add all that numbers together, and that is the amount of fragments that are now floating around that can be salvaged and checked and looked on. Um, if your ship that you are piloting, uh, your party ship, if it is uh, reduced to zero hit points, uh, the pilot should make death saving throws specifically for the ship, not for the pilot himself. But on three failures, the ship breaks apart and you would roll the D6s just like normal. But on three successes, the ship holds together, but it's still at zero hit points and unable to travel. Then we get into spell jamming helms. I have the major helms, which are the typical 5e spell jamming helm. Nothing really interesting that, except I do talk about the spell surge rules. Uh, and then there are mind flare helms, which are pool helms, uh, beholder helms. And then Forges and Furnaces, which are Dwarven Helms, where you can literally sacrifice magic items to give you a Spell Surge bonus going forward. Um, just kind of different types of Helms that you might come across. And then the other fun one, the Neogi Life Jammer Helms, which use your hit die to actually uh, propel you forward. So you're sacrificing your life, your hit dice, to uh, move the ship forward. And I thought that was really cool. And then I have some closing stuff and resources and inspiration at the end. I'm going to use a bigger ship here. This is the Hammerhead. And these are all clear. The bases are clear. And I think that's intentional so we can uh, structure it on the hex. Now, specifically with a hex, it's, you're going to have six sides and you want it to face one of those sides, not a corner. So the front of the ship will then be facing one of those sides. And that's how you travel from hex to hex. So I can go boom, boom. I can turn. So if we have a boulder here or whatever. I'm going to go one, two, turn three. Four, turn five, six, seven. And so then I moved a little slower because I had to turn. And I think that's what's going to separate combat for us in this instance versus a regular 5e combat. Now the Wasp has a speed of 50, so we're going to say they can move 10 hexes. And that is also part of their turn. So they can go one, turn two, three, four, turn five, six, seven. And so you can see they can move a lot more around the battlefield than um, a larger ship like this that has just a slower speed. Now, if you have just a regular spell jamming helm, your spell jammer pilot will be able to do something that I'm calling spell surge, which is during their turn as a bonus action, they can move the amount that they want to move. And then they can also spell surge to burn a spell slot that will give them that many more hexes. So if I burn a fifth level spell slot, I will be able to move five more hexes. And this is just a way of the sorcerer who is, or the spellcaster, and this is a way for the spellcaster who's in charge of the ship's movement to have something extra to do. Maybe they can get in range. Maybe they can use this to get out of range. Uh, maybe they can use this to hide behind um, something so that the other person gets into a more interesting uh, point. Maybe they can use this to hide behind something so that the uh, other ship can't necessarily target them because of line of sight. So if we start this off and say these two ships are fighting against this one, we can roll initiative and say that the hammer ship is hammerhead ship. We can roll initiative and say the hammerhead ship is going first and it can move seven hexes and it can also fire um, some of its weapons. So for the ballista, it looks like it's here on the front of the ship and you could say that could swivel around, but it probably can't attack behind. The blunt ram is only going to be the front of the ship. And the two Mongols was one on the back, one on the front, and it can shoot forward and shoot behind. So really you're getting possibly two attacks from the front, three if you do this, and one attack from the back if you're fleeing. So let's say this guy wants to attack our living ship. But he is currently faced, uh, we'll say this way, 
he needs to get his uh, alignment with that ship. So he's going to move uh, one and then two, three, four, and then turn for five. And we'll say now that he has a line. Well, not really five. So we'll go five, six. Ooh, I can't get into that other space though. Seven. So again, this is up to the DM, but I would say that you would have line of sight there. And so then they can make an attack. Um, or this guy could spell surge for like three and try to get out of the way. So one, two, three. And so that's it, ladies and gentlemen. This is pretty straightforward. I've been working on this for quite a bit. Like I said, I haven't super play tested it, but it's one of those things where I the the 2E rules really did work just fine. I think we just needed to clean them up a little bit and make them a make a 5E version of it, which is what we were expecting Wizards of the Coast to do, but they didn't. So let's do it. Let's go have Spelljammer adventures. There's literally a free Spelljammer adventure on D&D Beyond that you can take and run. And I would love to know if you try out these new rules and if they work out. Thanks again, WizKids, for giving me all of those minis to make this. So I hope that this makes ship combat more fun for you guys. I think it would be a lot of fun for me. Um, if you run into any problems, let me know. You can email me at Jordan with a PH, so J-O-R-P-H-D-A-N at gmail.com. And just put the title as uh, Spelljammer Rules. And I will take a look at it and maybe we can make this a living document and update it uh, whenever we need to. Thanks again for watching everyone and I will see you all in the next video.